United States submarine base at Key West, Florida. A dispatch that quoted President Truman's press secretary, Charles Ross, as saying that President Truman has no knowledge of any secret project by this government that would give substance to the existence of such objects. Ross also said that both the Air Force and the Navy deny that such objects exist. Hold on, let me get this here. Oh, God damn it. Sorry. What were you going to say? I was going to say, wait, let me get this yawn out, but then I oh. did it anyway, right when we started. Sorry. I was already, like, I was already starting to ski downhill, and I couldn't stop. I was already at my 45-degree angle, which is the most optimum of speeds, so. Mm-hmm. I don't know about skiing. That's the only thing that came to mind, though. I can't think past this. GD acid reflux I've got going on right now. I'm just suffering. God, that's... I don't know why you have acid reflux, because you ate a chicken nugget yesterday. Yeah. It's insane. That is insane. You should take a Tums about it. Dude, I took a Tums last night, and then the chalky taste that it had in my mouth like made me want to throw up. And I, it, like, even just thinking about it now, I start to get that salivating that you get when you're about to throw up, and I don't know what it is. So I think Tums, they make the chewable ones that are like candy now. They taste like candy. They're yeah. so good. I'll just pop a few of those just I to know. get a little snacky. I need to get something, but I was like desperate, and it was like midnight by the time I was finally ready to lay down. And I've just been working all day, which I'm sure you can attest to. And then the second we were both done with work, we started to record. Yeah, there is no rest for the wicked, and apparently there's no rest for the acid reflux. Um, Hey, what's up? My name is Noelle, and before I do anything, I chew two Tums chewable candies and pop two Excedrin. Uh, And I'm Chelsea. I have just been relying on the Shasta ginger ale. I have a sneaking suspicion that generic brand ginger ale is not good for acid reflux it's not hitting the way that regular ginger ale does but you gotta get what you gotta get i do have a vizzy on standby so i also have a feeling that (laughs) is not good for acid reflux but i have like so i have my water but then drinking water like makes it worse i think the acid is floating on the water which is making it come out of my esophagus easier here you go the worst foods for acid reflux Number one, coffee and tea. Okay. Caffeinated beverages aggravate it. Number two, carbonated beverages. The bubbles expand in your stomach, creating more pressure and pain. Um, chocolate, apparently a bad one. Um, it is, this treat has a trifecta of acid reflux problems, caffeine, fat, and cocoa. Peppermint, grapefruit and orange, tomatoes, alcohol, fried foods, late night snacks. All things that you should not take if you have acid reflux. Best things for it, chicken breast, which apparently is what you say caused it. Well, Um, vegan. (laughs) It was plant-based. I don't want anyone to think I sold out. um, Lettuce, celery, and sweet potatoes, brown rice, melons, oatmeal, fennel, ginger. But not... Generic brand ginger ale. Well, ginger ale is um, normally my go-to. It is my go-to. But yeah, it's probably the generic brand ginger ale. Yeah. And they say like uncaffeinated ginger tea is what they say. But then um, uh, they then, then they said, wait a minute, because then they said coffee and tea also aggravates it. Yeah, because if they have caffeine. <sighs> oh, it's, it's the caffeine. It's the caffeine. <clears throat> well, I don't know what to do because I drink coffee all damn day and I'm not going to stop. Yeah, you just suffer, I guess, like the rest of us. Yeah. So. I mean, I ate Velveeta. I don't know what else I can do. Um, I don't know what to say to that because that's nasty to me. The thought of acid reflux bubbling up your esophagus and then you just trying to coat it with liquid cheese slime is foul to me. So. Yeah. Don't say that's it like that because now it's going to feel foul to me. Oh. Well, it is foul. So. <laughs> Oh, oh, you should feel that way. Oh man, I don't feel good now. <laughs> oh my god. Um, yeah, that made me. That messed me up welcome. a little bit. You're <coughs> <welcome. laughs> um, speaking of things that messed me up, so we're talking about vampires today. Yeah, we're doing a relaxed fit episode um, because you've been out of town. 
and I had to emotionally recover from you being out of town. Yeah, so I've also been out of my that. mind. So the idea of doing a heavily researched episode right now, this is this is so on, this is the us. <laughs> like we have all of these um, in the chamber, ready to go, like not ready to go. They need final touches. They need to be like, you know, yeah, glittered up, gussied up, if you will. Um, episodes but they're like so good we don't want to like do them right now when we're brain dead yeah it's like the stan lee episode i gotta do it justice and i'm not gonna fuck it up by just being disrespectful to wanting to hate on stan lee the stan lee episode is our white buffalo it is yeah. also my metal detecting it is also your scuba diving yeah the fear it's... of doing it incorrectly it prevents us from doing it completely Yep, that's exactly it. I'm like, I'm not, I can't do it yet. We're going to just put this on the back table. We even had the author of that book willing to come on and mm -hmm. talk about the hate he got when he wrote the Stan Lee book. And he was like, I'm into it. Let's do it. Let's tear this motherfucker down. And we were like, we'll be in touch. And then we just never spoke again. And then we lost touch of reality completely. Yeah. Um, it's also one of those topics where like, it's just going to open a can of worms, I fear, and I also love. So I just want to, like, ha be so ready. You know what I mean? Like, we have to go to war. I'm ready. Like, yeah, it's that's one of those. Th I feel like the Stanley episode and then the Antarctica proper episode. I don't think we'll ever do Antarctica. If we do Antarctica, it's going to be, like, from my deathbed, and it's just going to be my fever dreams of screaming into the void. Mm -hmm. um, the Stanley, yeah, that's our white buffalo. We'll do it soon. We have to. We'll get we'll get like uh, Appalachian folklore out of the way, and then we will do maybe one more brain rot episode, and then we'll dive into um, maybe honestly kind of presenting the convention circuit. Dive into Stanley shit. Yeah, because we're gonna have to start prepping for Comic Con soon. But I digress. Yes, we we're talking about vampires, but it's yes. kind of loose fit. Um, I'm gonna try to not go into like too much history but then at the same time it's like important for the episode to come to fruition to go over stuff that people have probably heard of before um you know what some of it was new to me too every day i learn so let's not yeah. stop now so imagine a figure shrouded in the mists of time forever intertwined with the origins of dracula that person is none other than vlad the impaler also known as vlad tips is it Teps or Tepes? Um, great question. Born in the year 1428. His story unfolds in what we now call Romania, nestled near the enchanting Danube River Valley. Vlad's reign as ruler of Wallachia, a, neighboring, a land neighboring the mythical realm of Transylvania in the majestic Carpathian Mountains, was far from ordinary. Not once, not twice. But thrice did he grasp the mantle of power between 1448 and 1477. It's as if fate itself had deemed him a force to be reckoned with. However, I bet it wasn't just fate. I bet it was, it was yeah. also like the bodies on stakes that made human carcass fences around the properties. Yeah. But what if that was like steroids at the time? Is that like literal interpret? Is that like the literal physical manifestation of fate? Is human Eating kebabs. People? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Remember how we did the Prion episode about how, like, cannibalism can make you go literally insane? Mm-hmm. That's fun. Yeah. Um, but what truly sets Vlad apart is his insatiable thirst for blood, earning him a dark reputation that echoes through the corridors of history. His name sends shivers down the spine, evoking tales of horror and fear. But let's not forget the web of influences that spun around Vlad, which shaped his destiny. His father, the pr Prince of Wallachia, I'm saying it so wrong, I already know it, but I can't, we're already too far deep, uh, held immense <laughs> sway within elite circles of time. Yet, it is his father's affiliation with the enigmatic Order of the Dragon, a clandestine military society, that casts an even deeper shadow over Vlad's story. From this association emerged another name, Vlad Dracul, meaning Vlad the Dragon, forever cementing his place in the annals of legend. 
In the tapestry of history, Vlad the Impaler emerges as both feared and revered, and his dark lineage is intertwined with secrets and power. The threads of his story reveal the fascinating interplay between family ties, hidden societies, and the unquenchable thirst for control and blood. Nice. Um, <laughs> truly, the tale of Vlad the Impaler invites us to traverse the blurred lines between history and myth, where the extraordinary and the macabre intertwine in a dance as old as time itself. With the undertones reminiscent of the enigmatic Knights Templar from centuries past, the Order of the Dragon carried out their unofficial duties with fervor. Much like their predecessors, they sought to eradicate heresy and defended against the Sultan of Turkey's forces. In extraordinary circumstances, they even found themselves at odds with the rival Christian kingdoms in Europe, forming an intriguing web of alliances and conflicts. You were going to say, in extraordinary circumstances, I feel almost expected prophecy. Of the Order of the Dragon versus Christian kingdoms in Europe? Like the, the serp, like the dragon, you can make the case that it's like the serpent versus mm -hmm. yeah yeah i wonder what the world would have been like had vlad's influence been like washed in instead of christianity like what would um italian folklore magic look like or what would we get with like greek mythology that was all bastardized by the christian church like i don't think it would everything be would be good. it would everything would be way more heavy metal i think yeah because like we had this moment in history, right? And through local storytelling, like this mythos was created, this like gory, bloody. I mean, I even think of like Vlad the Impaler and like Elizabeth Bathory are like yeah. two of the most prolific. Their histories intertwine with fantasy and kind of lore. Um, exaggeration to create like this insane, um, like insane version of like, ec like fake reality, essentially. You know what I mean? Ex yeah. What What would you call that? It's almost like this. It's fantasy. Re it's like the mix, the perfect blend of fantasy and yeah. reality. But it's like people believed it, and so they feared it, and then those stories spread, and then just like every game of telephone, it just got like more intense and more insane as it traveled with people across yeah. the world. And that's just from one like city country experience. If we had had this type of like, if we had had Vlad the Impaler take over more ground, conquer more, influence more you would have a bigger epicenter. And I feel like with a bigger epicenter, you would have even crazier stories. You would have more circumstances to create crazier realities that breed these like insane stories. And it would just make, I, I think everything way more heavy metal and cool I and agree. scary. I think we would have been like, rather than having these moments of enlightenment that come from like, science and religion mm -hmm. um i feel like we would just be in a perpetual dark age i agree that's actually like when i think of like what our life would be like if, if vlad had taken over i immediately just went like medieval peasantry of like walking through mud and muck and just plague on plague on plague yeah i just think you have a society built on um the glorification of war um, cause like we obviously are a society and a people built on war and conquering and imperialism, but I think that like the type of war that was like happening in, you know, 1448 and like 1476 is mm -hmm. that, um, like dark there, there is no honor among thieves type of you know yeah. like war like just suffering and brutality and um it's almost like how extreme and fearful you could be wins the war not even the deaths that you cause but what you can yeah. do to scare the people and like if that's the heartbeat of the society of every single person in it not just people who are fighting but even like the people who live in the towns and villages like i think that's you know you're going to get spooky scary. Like yeah. the fact that 
like Vlad the Impaler is what brought Dracula. You know what I mean? The the story is uh, whether they're based in reality or based in myth of Vlad the Impaler made Bram Stoker write Dracula says enough. Mm-hmm. Like if we had even more of that influence around, like what other like dark heartbeats of society would be created. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that Vlad would have been interesting because he would have been the big bad boogeyman, whereas the church had the devil and then they could just kind of mold him to whatever they wanted him to be. Like, oh, the devil is sex out of marriage or the devil is like a like a baby born in the amniotic sack. Whereas like Vlad's like, I'm the goddamn devil and I'm here to impale your country. Like I feel like that reign of terror. Like I wonder if that would have been a tradition that would have kept on and we all would have been fucking impaled by now, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean like even think of, think of like not just that being like the physical manifestation of evil and like the physical presence of it, not just like a theory or an idea or a fear, like it's actually there tangible in front of you. Think of like the traditions that come out of like, Romania and like East Europe, yeah. like you get that darker lore. You know what I mean? You yeah. have everything about it is like a little bit harsher, the harsher winters, harsh summers, harsh rulers, harsh history. Yeah. Um, so if you had like someone who was like one of the pinnacle members of making the history kind of like scary lore um, mm-hmm. expand, it would be just a scary er, I feel like Europe like European history yeah. it would be it would be sick it would be cool but on a tangent i bet we would have thrived as a, as a society if elizabeth bathory had been in charge because i just read a conspiracy theory that she didn't do any of that stuff it was just people trying to make her seem an insane witch because they didn't want any woman to come to power i mean yeah there's like oh. that's the fun part right just like there are People who say that Vlad the Impaler was just a nice guy and he was just Mm -hmm. a good ruler who wanted to protect his country and actually didn't, like, you know, do all these horrific, gory murders and presentings of bodies. Um, But it kind of, like, doesn't matter. Like, when... Whether he was just a guy who wore dark robes and scared people with a, like, intense glare and if she yeah. was just a a girl a pretty girl ruling and they didn't want her to do that like it, it kind of didn't matter like yeah because the, the lore that was created around them almost like worked in their favor by making them so scary yeah she was just a girl boss man and she wanted yeah. to throw a facebook party for her milky leggings yeah even though there are people who accounts historical historical accounts that say like all of the like milkmaids if you will yeah. disappeared around mm-hmm. the palace and um yeah so mm-hmm. whether but i think that i think it's kind of like commonly agreed now that it wasn't that she was like cuz the stories are that she puts you know like a virgin a hanging above her bathtub by their wrists and ankles and she slices them with a scythe and bathes in the blood and i think it was less of that and more just her beating the ever loving shit out of um like poor girls who yeah. she would force to come and work at the palace like they would think that their parents would send them away thinking that they were getting like you know they were going to have a better life there they would get clothed housed and fed yeah. and then in reality they were beat to death um i think that's the reality but still i would still give her the name like the blood countess because she did have a lot of blood on her hands yeah good good for her honestly um i just i i'm choosing to believe it was only enemies blood who deserved it and then all the girls who went and disappeared are actually the ancestors of other badass women like joan of arc um joan of arc was what i'm not even gonna get it joan of arc was cool as hell Mm. Mm. what okay yeah it's okay to be like mm, about it, but like to have those sorts of manis- manifestations and then be cemented in history as like a political or a war genius when you really weren't, and maybe you were just an insane young girl. 
that's cool as hell. I mean, we could agree that that's cool as hell. I guess it's the fact that like one of her BFFs was like a fucking murderous pedophile, but you know, that's yeah. actually yeah. par for her to be made a saint in the Catholic Church. So I guess it all checks out biblically. Yeah, when you're right, you're right. What was it like, Jacques? Okay. Yeah, I don't he, remember his name. He was the one who helped her win every war because she didn't have the she actually military genius. Yeah. Yeah, she yeah. wasn't that good at it, and he did all yep. of it, but she got all the credit. Yes. Um, so as Vlad ascended to the throne in 1456, he stepped into a world of political turmoil and internal strife. The journey to this rightful place was marred by assassinations, including the tragic demise of his own father. It is a twist of fate that those responsible for such torment were among his worst enemies. John uh, Hunyadi was um, deeply involved in the plot to assassinate Vlad's father and the formidable Sultan of Turkey. Ironically, Vlad and his brother had been placed under the Sultan's care by their father, an arrangement that ultimately led to the elder Vlad's assassination due to his dealings with the Turks. Curiously, these early days of Vlad's rule were marked by an astronomical phenomenon. Recording speak of a peculiar comet appearing over the capital of Wallachia, adding an eerie backdrop to the already tumultuous events unfolding. These intricate details weave together a tapestry of power struggles, personal vendettas, and celestial wonders, casting a shadow of intrigue over the reign of Vlad. It is within these enigmatic moments that we glimpse the extraordinary forces shaping his destiny and the blood-soaked path he would carve in history. The appearance of the strange comet does remain a mystery, whether it held significance as an omen, a mere coincidence, or possibly an even more tangible phenomenon. Regardless, this celestial event marked a turning point for Vlad, solidifying his reputation and asserting his firm control over the region. In Wallachia, the true power resided with noblemen, though, known as the Boyers, even as the occupant of the throne changed over time. So despite the demise of influential figures like John Hunyadi, who met his fate on the battlefield months prior, uh, many of the boyers responsible for authorizing the assassination of Vlad's father still thrived. These noble individuals anticipated the new ruler to be subservient to their whims and desires. However, Vlad had different plans in mind, clearly. Summoning all 500 of these boyers to his primary castle residence in Turkoviste, Vlad set the stage for a shocking and brutal display of power. As his audience gathered in the main hall, his guards emerged from outside, swiftly apprehending the unsuspecting nobleman. What followed was a systemic impalement of large wooden stakes. Some were impaled through the stomach, meeting a relatively swift demise, while others suffered a more tortuous fate as the stake was inserted into their rectums and raised <laughs> upward, their own weight gradually mangling the insides as the pole pierced through their upper bodies. The agony endured by some lasted for days. Or if you live in capitalistic society, it lasts till you retire. Yeah, not even till you're dead. Um, a question. Would you rather be crucified or would you rather be impaled? Okay, am I being impaled through my butt or through my stomach? I'm going to say through your butt. I'd rather be crucified. Yeah? I, uh, yeah. Because I think that, um, at least with crucifixion, I feel like I would go f just as slowly, but with potentially less agony. Well, I feel like them saying that, like, they their insides were mangled and it took them days to die. Um, I feel like that's not true. I feel like if you were staked through your fucking asshole, through your mouth, you would die instantaneously. If I would say even faster than through your stomach. But it's like it's like when you screw a lid back on a soda pop wrong. You know what I mean? Like you got to get it right on there for it to go up your butt and out your mouth. But you know they're not fucking doing this shit gracefully. So it's probably going up your butt and out through your back. And then you're mm -hmm. probably just like slumped forward. Well, even with that, I have a feeling it would rupture uh, like your intestines and well, cause like sepsis and you would die pretty quickly versus crucifi crucifixion is like just hanging. It's just weight. It's the weight like. But if you get you. crucified upside down, you're going to pass out in like an, an hour. Yeah, but who is getting crucified upside down? I'm saying like, do you want to go Jesus style? 
Jesus style or Vlad the Impaler style? Well, I'm assuming it would be upside down, but I, even sepsis can take up to 12 hours. Versus how long does it take you to die on, a, on the cross? Not upside down. Let me look. I can't just go into this shit without doing research. Death usually occurs. How long does it take to die from crucifixion? So it's anywhere from six hours to four days. But I four feel like days. that's that's similar to getting fucking staked through the butt. No, I feel because like I feel like you I getting staked through the butt and potentially through your mouth, but no matter what, it always piercing through your intestines, causing sepsis at the latest twelve hours. Crucifixion, if you're like a medium to small sized person as you are, skinny legend, you're not gonna have the weight ripping you down more. You're gonna hang for a while. I think you're gonna die four days on the cross. Okay, I'm going to see how long it takes to die from bowel perforation. Yeah. I also would like to think that my sphincter muscles are so tight and strong that I would grab it with my sphincter and yeah. like push it out. Yeah, I got <laughs> My anus hole is a church lady and she is <laughs> guarded and she's a Karen. So like, I you know, that it's diamond with my fucking <laughs> asshole. Yeah, same. <laughs> Like, Honestly, I do every three days. Yeah. <laughs> I guess my butthole is stronger than my intestines, so I know it's stronger yeah. than wood, man. I would just be like, you know, like in those cartoons where it shows animals like eating corn on the cob, and it's just like, ah, da, 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 like a beaver. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. it. I would just be like rotating down it like a twirly twirl and uh, just eating it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, but also, I don't know, I guess it depends, like, because crucifixion, like, you can asphyxiate pretty quick, because you can't have your arms like this for too long and be hanging by your body weight, because, like, you're, you're, we're just a weak people, you know? Yeah, but I think that uh, being dangled like that, you're probably going to last longer than getting a rod shoved through your asshole and intestines. I'm no scientist or doctor, but yeah. I am... Um, a woman of logic. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> I would want to go faster, but also like being lit on fire. If someone's like, would you rather get lit on fire or crucified? I would say crucified because I don't want to get lit on fire. Like I feel like a me. lot of people survive getting lit on fire. Yeah, I feel like do. that takes a while. I know one. My father was exploded and he's still bit bopping around. Yeah. So um, anyway, I guess it depends if that, like, if I can sit down and if I could weigh the pros and cons, if I can like get a, a written up contract sent over to our podcast attorney, mm -hmm. then I would make a decision right now. Yeah. I'm thinking maybe crucifixion because I feel like it would be less painful. And I feel mm. like I would kick out just as slowly as I would with a stick up my butt. Well, yeah, I think you need to sit with it more because I definitely think <laughs> I'll sit on it until yes. I die. Yeah, sit on I'll it <laughs> until it <laughs> sepsis from uh -huh. your leaking bowels takes your life. Yeah. yeah. So um, these 500 stakes bearing the lifeless bodies of the boyers were brought to the main courtyard and left on a macabre display. This chilling act served as a warning to all who dared challenge Vlad's authority. Such ruthless treatment of both, both enemies and, at times, his own subjects would become a recurring theme throughout his reign. It was during this period that he adopted the name Draculia or Draculia. I feel like it, those are the same things, uh, the same words I just said. Uh, a name that would eventually evolve into Dracula, obviously. And, interestingly enough, this name carries the meaning of dragon's son for his dad or devil's son. Thus, Vlad the Impaler's reign became synonymous with acts of extreme violence, earning him a legacy that evoked both fear and fascination. The transformation of his name reflects the dark aura surrounding his rule, leaving a mark on the pages of history. And the number of victims who met their gruesome end at the hands of Vlad uh, reached staggering proportions, reaching tens of thousands. Their lifeless bodies served as warnings to approaching armies, displayed as the chilling testament to the fate that awaited them. And among the reports that sent shivers down the spine, it is accounts of Vlad dining amidst his impaled victims that truly disturbed the senses. Many of these unfortunate souls were still clinging to life, teetering on the brink of death, and to add to the horror, Vlad would dip his bread into their blood, consuming it alongside his ghastly meal. Hearsay. 
That's wild, though. Conjecture. <laughs> I could see him doing that. I'll shit on Vlad, but I'll protect Elizabeth. <sighs> that's that's very pink-haired feminist in 2010 on Tumblr of you. Yeah, I know what I am. <laughs> I've only heard bad things about Vlad. Maybe he was a sweetheart. Maybe we should do a Vlad deep dive one of these days. Yeah, what if this is like... What if this is just another who is actually right and wrong in the Bible because the victors are yeah, the ones who write history. history. I don't know. So, chew on that steak and sit on it. Uh, is it a plant-based steak and is it soft enough for me to chew it? I was talking about a steak like as in a piece of wood, a wooden oh, dowel. No. But I, whatever you prefer, actually. Okay. But isn't that fun, though? Like, steaks and Vlad, and then it gets tied into Dracula. Anyway. Um, <laughs> furthermore, there are instances... Yeah, that's where it came from, girl. I know. I'm just, I just put that together. The steak oh thing. Oh, my God. Uh, furthermore, <laughs> no, well, there were instances where Vlad arranged his impaled victims in specific patterns, like crop circles, often in circular formations, <laughs> and would stand amidst them while eating, like we said. This type of activity, particularly if we entertain the idea of it occurring on certain ritualistic days, bears the hallmarks of ancient human sacrifice. It beckons or just a-, a guy who wants to have a good time. Yeah, I'd like to imagine he was playing air guitar in the middle of it. You know, I have seen, I hate to say it, you know what I mean? I hate to say it, but I have seen clips from the new Fast and Furious movie of Jason Momoa's character sitting with his hair in space buns. Um, chit-chatting it up in a friendly manner and then it pans to two dead guys he's propped up and taped eyes like taped their eyes open and their mouths as a smile and that's what I envision of my Vlad yeah he's just cosplaying Harley Quinn it's adorable yeah, he's just having a little fun time he's just having a <laughs> gaff um, so this does beckon us to ponder the potential roots of these rituals in the depths of antiquity especially when we consider the historical significance of the Black Sea region and the surrounding mountainous areas. These routes served as conduits between Asia and the ancient mystery schools of Egypt and Babylon. Many who embarked on these journeys would later ascend to positions of power as monarchs and influential families in Europe. While some do not question the authenticity of these accounts, others delve deeper into the notion that the thirst for blood goes beyond mere brutal displays. Before we explore those claims, however, it is worth briefly examining the most renowned rendition of vampire legends and, most importantly, the author behind it. So while the origins of the character Dracula can be traced back to the 1400s, it was Bram Stoker, a 19th century writer, who introduced the world to this iconic figure through his novel published in 1897. However, some researchers in symbolism and esoteric knowledge propose that Stoker's work contains more than just fiction. It actually conceals hidden wisdom. According to these theories, clues to this hidden knowledge can be found within the pages of Stoker's famous novel. One striking simul- similarity often mentioned is Dracula's ability to shapeshift or control the thoughts of others akin to possession. The name Count Dracula itself is believed by some to be a hint at the activities of nobles and royal bloodlines, commonly referred to as the elite. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I like how weird this is going. Hillary Clinton. His insatiable need for blood is seen as a metaphor for the alleged secret sacrificial rituals practiced by these elites. And additionally, Dracula's frequent entry through windows is interpreted by some as a symbolic representation of a portal signifying an otherworldly existence. This particular aspect does warrant further examination. With many cryptids and myths that we have discussed on the podcast, we often find that truth tends to be hidden in plain sight and often repeat, where there's smoke, there's fire, and such is the case with vampires. Surely no one doubts the existence of Vlad the Impaler, but you're less likely to find anyone who believes in real-world vampires like Dracula. However, the idea that Stoker's work weaves into fiction becomes or weaves fact into fiction, becomes less outlandish than it may initially seem, especially once we finally get into the bulk of this week's episode. Um, here's the thing. I, I feel like we've talked about this before. I think, quote-unquote, vampires by definition exist, but I just don't think they're sexy, cool, fun. I think they're like uh, 
a receding hairline polyamorous house that uh, sucks each other's blood while listening to Nine Inch Nails. Oh, yeah. They're in a new metal for sure. And I mean. it's like a like, Reddit mod. Yeah, he's a Reddit moderator for sure. He probably runs a Burger King like the fucking Navy. Um, he's a well, actually. Definitely. I, I feel like he probably has like seven ferrets and they all free roam in the house. I feel like when he gets his lip pierced, he does it right here in the middle of his lip. And instead oh, of just getting what a is regular. That called? A labre. labre. But instead of getting like a regular just piece of jewelry, he gets one of those little fang things like a bleep. Oh my god, like, isn't it like the lead singer of Disturbed has it? I fucking believe it, or Seether, you know? So, like, yeah, one of those fucking assholes. Yeah, yeah. one of those. And you're like, Dude, yeah. yeah, like, vampires like, exist, but they're not sexy. They're not no. Brad Pitt. They're not cutie. They are, they, they are the only people keeping Spencer's in malls in existence. Yeah. Yeah, they for sure have like seventeen Rick and Morty bongs. Like it's just not cute. Yeah. They exist, but they're not cute. Yeah, and they say "lol" just in conversation, like R O F M A L O. You know, yeah. they're just stuck in old internet culture. Yeah, I bet they have an Android, and they talk about like Android superiority every day, oh like God. anyone fucking cares. Fucking, yeah, or they send you like porno anime. Dude, I, the game. <laughs> I know. I so, do. Yeah, Noel, I, know. I yeah. have a question for you. <laughs> I maybe have an answer. If I asked you what the vampire capital of the United States was, what would you say? New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, I thought you would have said Pennsylvania just because of the name. But I like your style anyway, but you are wrong. Uh you, oh, I was like, bitch, Pennsylvania, but because Vania, like Transylvania. Yeah, that's what I, I thought. I never gave Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is such a flat mayonnaise on a white bread type place that I never even gave credence to it having a Vania spooky name. I thought it sucked so much that it just was like, shit like i couldn't even see past that i couldn't even see that so yeah i you I taught do. me that today new orleans is a good guess too but we're both wrong because my guess was pennsylvania uh it's actually rhode island <laughs> you know um, what i would that would be my second guess yeah it wouldn't even have been my 50th guess so really uh i don't think i forget rhode island exists it's like D delaware delaware probably would have been my fifth <laughs> guess um but let's jump back to the 1800s so, in the 1870s, George and Mary Brown, a married couple, relocated to Rhode Island and purchased a farm in the town of Exeter. Their economic standing could be described as average, neither extremely wealthy nor impoverished, and accompanied by their young children, they pretty much enjoyed a harmonious family life. However, the Brown family's fortune took a dark turn in the early 1800s when a series of tragic events unfolded. In 1883, I don't know why I said early 1800s, because 1883 isn't early 1800s. Yeah, it's kind of towards the end, but that's okay. Uh, in late 1800s, Mary fell seriously ill and passed away shortly thereafter. Shockingly, just six months later, their seemingly healthy 20-year-old daughter, Mary Olive Brown, also died suddenly and under mysterious circumstances. Although a period of relative calm ensued, more misfortune struck in 1891 when George's remaining daughter, Mercy, and his son, Edwin, fell gravely ill. While Edwin's condition remained critical, the 19-year-old Mercy succumbed to the same fate as her sisters and mothers before her. Mother this before is her. how I know we were just not washing our hands back in the late yeah. 1800s. If your entire house goes down... You have to wash the sheets. You have yeah. to get some Lysol in there. You've got to get a Clorox wipe to the door handles. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. just know that these motherfuckers were scratching their assholes with their unclipped nails and making a fucking apple pie and feeding it to the entire crew. Yeah. And also, like, obviously the dad's going to be fine because he actually gets to go out and build up his immune system while he makes his wife and sickly children stay home all damn day. This is really yeah. just a story of feminism. Yeah, it always comes back to it, you know. Oh. 
So upon the tragic demise of his wife and children, as well as Edwin's ongoing illness, George sought solace from the local doctor, who, along with the increasingly talkative townspeople, attributed their suffering to consumption. Easy. What was consumption again? I think consumption was just dying from poop. What? I don't know. It's a wasting disease. Um, Like tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. It is tuberculosis. Dying of poop. (laughs) What causes consumption? (laughs) Is it Um, poop? No, it's airborne respiratory droplets, like coughs or sneezes. So again. Well, that's how it spreads. Yeah, it's bacteria. It's like a bacteria. Bacteria from poop. Does poop cause... I swear consumption went down because we actually started getting sewage. What? I mean, this goes back to my um, theory about them not washing their hands and scratching their assholes. Probably. But what? They they got got by the same thing that typhoid Mary gave everyone, which was typhoid. So very different. Um, Nowadays, this affliction is recognized as tuberculosis. We're done. We should have just read the next sentence. A highly preventable disease at this time. or prevalent disease at the time, but is very preventative now, which wreaked havoc across vast regions of the United States. Overwhelmed hospitals and asylums grappled with a surge of patients facing the grim prospects of this often fatal disease. Curiously, the townsfolk, without providing a complete rationale, propagated the belief that a member of the Brown family had transcended the confines of the grave, infecting the surviving relatives. Furthermore, they asserted that these reanimating beings, uh, referred to as vampires, harbored intentions of turning their attention to the other inhabitants of Exeter and the surrounding areas of Rhode Island. According to local residents, one of the recently deceased Browns had become a vampire, and the next presumed victim in line would be Edwin. Here's the thing. No one gives a fuck about Rhode Island. I thought that Rhode, I was mixing up what we do in the shadows. They're from Staten Island. I thought that. Was <laughs> um, no one gives yeah. a fuck about Rhode Island. Also, obviously, the separation of time and the um, cartoonish retellings of history make these types of stories so silly, funny, goofy to think about now, where it was kind of like, isn't it just like fun? in a dark way that you could just turn to someone and be like vampire. And everyone's like, ah, like it's, I mean, it is kind of related. It, we do do it in a modern way, but it is more fun and enjoyable when it's like silly, goofy, universal monsters. Like we don't fear that anymore. Yeah. Like we, we don't, but it, it is kind of like fun in a dark lore way to just turn around and be like with no fun. Again, similar echoes of today, but less funny because today it's about real people. And then we were like, werewolves and the witches and the vampires, they're going to suck your blood and eat your Mm -hmm. kids. Um, And now people are just like afraid of them, you know, gender fluidity. It's, I wish that we had fun stuff to fear now. Like, I think, I think vampires existing maybe if we're talking about like the cryptid level of it maybe exist in a way we don't quite understand like energy vampires and not like i i agree the reddit male exists and they are the scariest thing plaguing our society yes. but i like the idea that there is something to the mysticism of vampires existing in a way that maybe we don't understand which would be so much cooler because like what are we so scared of when we go walking down, like walking in the middle of the night? Or like, what are we scared of in our basements where we have to like scuttle up the stairs and shut the door really quick? Like that's well, where I think vampires live. If you, if you want like my real opinions and thoughts about it, I wish that I could suspend, like I could have a suspension of disbelief um, and enjoy that. Like maybe it came from like vampires and werewolves and, you know, creatures from the Black Lagoon. But to me, even with this story, it is just the scariest thing in the world is just us. It's just people. It's just humanity. And throughout history, throughout human history, there's been a, like, rise of the monster that, like, matches what's going on in the climate, like, what people fear. 
and um, like people were fearing each other. They didn't understand why people were getting sick and dying because they were idiots who didn't wash their hands and no one knew what penicillin was. Yeah. Um, but like rather like they had to make a monster out of the person, which yeah. is literally a vampire. So, yeah. I mean, it, what's interesting too is like this is a couple hundred years after the Salem witchcraft trials and it's still like the same or similar fears. Like we don't learn from our mistakes of treating people. Like in the Salem witchcraft trials, it's probably like more mental illness. And then in this, it's like physical uh, afflictions. But man, people are just so scared of like what they don't understand. So they have to attribute something to it. Yeah. You always have to create a monster. Yeah. And that's the unfortunate line throughout history and humanity that we keep seeing and experiencing. It's just in different fonts throughout the centuries, but For we sure. always make a monster. Yeah. But they would not, they're not as smart as we are in the well. Because uh, George Brown eventually granted permission for his wife and deceased children to be exhumed. It's fun and cool. <laughs> Great, right? um, on a cold afternoon of March 17th, 1892, in Chestnut Hill Cemetery, amidst the presence of several residents, the local doctor, and a journalist from the local newspaper, the solemn process began. As they examined the graves of Mary Brown and her namesake daughter, nothing suspicious or out of the ordinary was uncovered. The doctor confirmed that their level of decomposition was as expected, and they assumed nothing from looking at the bodies. You know what I will say here? Yeah. I do this on a very toned-down level with the dogs. Um, I do it mostly, and with the dogs, I mean Kofi, Ty's dog, because uh -huh. my dogs don't really bark. But Kofi barks at nothing all the time, and so... Uh, telling him to shut up doesn't do anything. So I physically grab him and I hold him and I open the front door and I make him look out and I show him that there's nothing. And I go, don't you feel stupid? Don't you feel like a fucking idiot? <laughs> and then he literally stops barking because he's like, oh my God, you're so right. I am an idiot. There's nothing here. And so mm -hmm. I assume that this was like kind of similar to like what the townspeople were doing when they dug up dead bodies and yeah. they didn't see fucking vampires and they just saw necrotic flesh yeah and they're like oh dang it maybe and now they was stupid now they're gonna get real sick by fucking around with dead bodies yeah yeah um but you're about to feel real dumb noel and kofi's gonna be redeemed with Why? his fears because when the grave of mercy brown was opened a sudden gas filled the air causing the onlookers to instinctively step back because contrary to expectations and despite having been buried for several months Mercy appeared eerily preserved, almost as if she had been in a deep slumber. Remarkably, her hair had remained in good condition and her fingernails had even continued to grow. A collective gasp arose when flesh, fresh blood emerged from her mouth as one of the men prodded her body with a spade. This is, well, first of all, your hair and nails, I'm pretty sure your nails, I'm not sure about your hair, continue to grow after you die. Nope, that's a myth. It's just because your your skin recedes as it dries out. Oh, even better. Yeah. Um, still, I have a very strong feeling that she did not look like she was in a deep slumber. I bet she looked like, you know, it's gone viral recently of like the nun, like they fucking dug up that fucking nun and they're all like, oh my God, she's perfectly preserved. The, the fucking foretelling of the prophecy. And then I saw the picture and I was like, she looks like a leather handbag. Are you yeah. fucking kidding me? No. Or she looks like a deflated balloon she looked like made a, of leather. She looks like a blissfully content Mona Lisa. <laughs> oh, she did. Steve, have you seen that picture? Do you know what I'm talking about? No. Look it up. Look it I up. Think it it's recent. It's like within the last month, they fucking dug up this poor dead nun. And <laughs> all the headlines are all like, she looks amazing. Oh, my God. The, the, <laughs> She's just like a withered mummy. And she is just a literal fucking mummy. She looks like <laughs> she looks like the fucking the raisin old person uh, skeleton worm from fucking Spongebob that's in the wheelchair. <laughs> like That's what she looks like. And they're literally all like, perfectly preserved. Oh, the, God has given us this gift. And I'm like, that is a dead body. That yeah. is a rotting corpse. It's girl. like when there was... 
It was like when we covered the, there was like a UFO that went down in South America, not the recent one, but we looked it up and it was just a plate, like a dinner plate. Yeah, oh it God, was it literally like, <laughs> but multiple, like multiple outlets are like, yeah, she looks incredible. And it was like, apparently like a whole prophecy, like, um, but I was like, y'all just dug up a fucking body dog. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look at they Look at this. Even this. No, I'm literally, I just typed in nun dug up. We have nun's body dug up years after her burial shows no signs of decay. Nun's body exhumed years after her death shows no signs of decay. Nun's digging up sister's remains finds body intact. And I'm like, look at the picture. Look at the pic girl. I saw the picture with her fucking. I know. Feet. Okay, let me find a better picture because the look one I her, saw, she does not hands. look that dead. Look at her hands and her feet. Okay. Oh, she looks. Yeah, she's got them. She has them Prince Charles hands. <laughs> she is rotting, girl. And then, like, her face is like caving in, like on the mouth and lips. Like, what? And some these motherfuckers have the audacity to look at this poor rotted woman who looks like a fucking raisin. And are like, oh my god, perfectly intact. And I'm like, put this poor fucking bitch back in the goddamn ground, you freaks. Mm-hmm. Well, but, so I assume that that's what they also saw. But anyway, continue to tell me that I'm wrong. Where? Well, the nun is lucky <laughs> she didn't get dug up by these people because they immediately formed a mob. Um, they took Mercy's heart and ceremoniously burned it on a nearby rock. Um, and then the ashes, oh, this part's wild. So then they took the ashes from her burned heart and mixed it into medicine to give to the brother. But now Bro. this is the only miracle that has happened in this whole story. He died before he could eat his sister's dead heart ashes. Thank God, you know what I mean? Yeah. Good. Um, we were really just out here freestyling. Like, humanity was just freestyling. Yeah. I don't think anywhere in the Bible it says to do that. So they were just, you know, riffing and they came up with that. And that is pretty cool and heavy metal. And, you know, it's mm-hmm. not like it's going to kill her because she was already dead. Yeah. So if you were super sick, though, and you thought you were going to die, would you eat someone's heart ashes? Is it a dead person's heart or a live person's heart? alive then dead were they murdered for me or were they already dead it doesn't matter it does you don't matter. know you're it ignorant. does matter <laughs> it does okay. matter yes the person was killed for you specifically but the person who was killed was baron trump yes okay yeah that's what about you uh yeah i like, also think it, put it in everything bagel seasoning yeah i need <laughs> it for the lovely salty game. it's yeah. delicious i love yeah. salt yeah, a nice everything bagel with a yeah. avocado. Dude, I could be at the sriracha. peak of my health, and they could be like, "This is Baron Trump's heart. It's going to make you ridiculously sick." And I'd still want to try it just for the love of the game. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. If yeah. they were like, "You can take part in cannibal," we are forcing you to take part in cannibalism, but it's going to be like Trump or Elon Musk. I'd be like, "Yeah, yeah, for sure." If I could take like a good hearty bite while they were still alive. Hmm. I just want to see them have pain. And I would just bite off the tip life. of their nose and chew on <laughs> it. <laughs> I would get right at the back of their Achilles tendon. And I just... Ooh, nah, 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 nah. Very House of Wax of you. And you know I don't have a good bite. So they're, that's the that's a misplaced butt steak is a bite for me. Because I'm like gumming you like the girl from Drag Me to Hell, the little old lady. Mm-hmm. That's me on the back of his ankle. Just... <laughs> <laughs> Nima's teeth fell out. And I'm yeah. just... Like one of those toys, like like Pac Man, walk yeah. walk 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 walk. <laughs> yeah. uh, good old cannibalism. It's, yeah. Anyway, so adding an intriguing twist to this grim and harrowing tale, it is worth noting that when Bram Stoker passed away, a collection of notes and newspaper clippings related to the Mercy Brown case were found amongst his new paper amongst his papers. Um, this discovery serves as a testament to the lasting impact and widespread belief in the Mercy Brown case, even during a time when information traveled at a considerably slower pace and across shorter distances. While many dismiss the Mercy Brown vampire incident, Noel, 
is a product of local superstition and lack of scientific understanding, the persistence of such legends remains intriguing. A similar tale unfolds with Nellie Vaughn, who tragically passed away three years before Mercy Brown, also at the tender age of 19. Reports of Nellie's haunted grave and sightings of her apparition have circulated over the years, accompanied by a chilling inscription on her tombstone. I am waiting and watching you. Oh, that's so cool. That is cool. I want something ominous on my tombstone. Yeah, me too. I like, want I people to be spooked out. Like, I think I want a tombstone, even though I don't want to be buried. Yeah, the, I would like a tombstone, and they could just put a little pelt of my ashes in the ground under it. But get a Furby and sew my hair to it and then bury that. But I would like to be cremated and then planted in a tree. Yeah, same. But we could split the remains, you know. Yeah. We can put a little, yeah, 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 yeah. make a creepy little spot. I would love a creepy little spot. Yeah. I would love to become an urban legend. Find a place out in the middle of nowhere and then put my tombstone there. But I'd have to think of something really creepy to put on it. Yeah, it has to be something on the lines of I am like on the same vein as I am waiting and watching you. Yeah, like I'll see you soon and you smell delicious. It has to be scarier than that. That seems kind of inviting. I don't know. We got to workshop it. Okay, we'll workshop it. Um, Adding to the enigma, a university professor's experiments revealed a peculiar absence of vegetation or lichen near Nellie's resting place. Yet, the most unnerving account involves Marlene Chatfield, who encountered a spine-chilling encounter with the supernatural. While visiting the cemetery near Nellie's grave one evening, Marlene and her husband found themselves alone when a disembodied female voice declared, I am perfectly pleasant. That's what I want on my tombstone. And then I want I want there to be speakers in the trees where it just plays children laughing. Mm, that um, would be good. That would be a good act. You could you could have it be solar powered. Yeah. Solar powered speakers. Mm-hmm. And suddenly Marlene's husband was intact by invisible hands, leaving deep scratches on his face. These inexplicable events surrounding Nellie Vaughn continue to captivate and bewilder those who dare to delve into the mysteries of her past. And Marlene Chatfield's encounters with the supernatural didn't end with her husband's unsettling attack. On a separate visit to the cemetery, accompanied by a researcher from a local historical society, they aimed to capture pictures for research purposes. Mm, Just a lovely Friday night out. That actually sounds like a nice date. Yeah, I would literally love that. If a girl was like, hey, I was, my husband was attacked at the cemetery where an apparent vampire was buried. Do you want to go? I'd be like, yeah. "Yeah." That could be like your Tinder profile tagline. Like literally, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Upon, or however, upon reaching Nellie's grave, the young woman inexplicably entered a peculiar trance-like state. She repeated the phrase, Nellie is not a vampire incessantly for approximately a minute adding to the mystique surrounding the tragic girl i think noel is not a vampire would be good for your grave uh that would and then be you could good, have a actually. smoke machine like a smoke machine i'll Ooh. have the children laughing and then you have a smoke machine a smoke machine would be super fucking cool yeah i would love an ominous bog fog to just be around the area at all times yeah also if we ever make a band it should the name of it should be ominous bog fog <laughs> that's a good idea i'll write so, it down <laughs> adding to the strangeness the developed photographs of nelly's grave appear grave appeared mysteriously reversed deepening the sense of the unknown and the eerie allure of this perplexing tale that is scary like if you take a photo of something and it's like mirrored like her grave and everything you'd be like yeah, what it's the fuck giving happened? very much red rum yeah that's cool The phenomenon of alleged vampires extends beyond the Mercy Brown case, like we've covered, spanning all over the upper northeast region of the United States. And throughout the 19th century, this widespread vampire panic was reminiscent of the witch trials of earlier centuries which gripped the area, with documented cases going all the way back to the 1700s. One such case like these involves Sarah Tillinghast, an intriguing coincidence being that she too was 19 years old at the time of her enigmatic and tragic demise. Sarah had a peculiar fascination with Rhode Island's graveyards, especially those of fallen revolutionary soldiers. She would spend hours immersed in books of poetry within these somber settings. Oh my god, she was just an Edgar Allan Poe girly. Yeah, she was just Noelle. Yeah, she After was just a- pick up your Starbucks on a Tuesday. She was having her graveyard era. 
Damn, we all did. We all had a graveyard era. After returning home from one of her customary visits, Cora snoring is adding to the, like, spookiness of it. It Sounds like a a ghost moaning. Yeah, she is fully (laughs) passed out. She is so cute. Should I wake her up? Yeah. Oh, it's like (laughs) Jabba waking up from a nap where he's like, ah. (laughs) <laughs> oh here she, i just see her little bum now she's so happy i'm um, watching your dad carry her up the stairs on the ring cam was just dude we will never know why he carried her i don't know <laughs> she's every small. day she's small she's fully capable she's a little chicken nugget she's a she little ham no. no she doesn't she's fine if you are the cause of my acid reflux you shouldn't have to walk up the stairs oh i believe God. that you should be carried <laughs> After returning home from one of her customary visits, Sarah suddenly fell gravely ill. Her fever soared and her health rapidly deteriorated. And within a few weeks, she passed away. However, the Tillen guests, family, uh, their ordeal was far from over. Because shortly after Sarah's death, her brother James awoke one morning in a, sh- a state of extreme illness, recounting a peculiar tale. He claimed he felt unbearably cold was shivering uncontrollably and experienced a heavy weight on his chest. Almost like the flu. Maybe, or consumption. Yeah. To their parents, Sarah's nighttime visitation at the foot of his bed seemed like a symptom of grief, prompting little concern. Tragically, James, too, succumbed to death a few weeks later. Um, let's pause there for a second. If my daughter had just died and my son was saying that he saw her every night at the foot of his bed, I wouldn't be like, oh, we all grieve differently. Yeah. I'd be like, what the fuck? Yeah, I'd be like, I would, yeah, you got to get him medicine and you have to get him an exorcism. You got to go for a two-prong attack. You got to kebab yeah. it like a piece of corn. Bah, bah. Yeah, you got to kebab it like you're a body in front of Vlad the Impaler's castle. I yeah. would also say, stop telling me this spooky shit, you little freak, you little creepy guy. That's what I would say. Yeah. I used to do this kind of shit to my mom. Like, I would just wake her up. And she'd be like, what? And I'm like, the lady under the bed says I need to come play. And my mom would be like, Jesus Christ. You're You're so lucky she didn't throw you outside. Yeah, I know. I know. I would just hit that kid with the hose. (laughs) I would just get the hose out, start spraying them, and be like, say that creepy shit again. I I wish a bitch would. Like, her just (laughs) kick me. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Uh, when two more telling guest children reported seeing Sarah appear on their beds at night, only to perish shortly er- thereafter, the surviving family members began to suspect not that their children were dying of a preventable disease, but yeah. that their own daughter was returning from beyond the grave, claiming so the lives of those she left behind. Typical. So typical. They were like, our children aren't dying because we don't wash our hands and we eat food covered in animal shit. They've got to be dying from vampires. Yeah. But also, who wouldn't go? Like, who wouldn't go? I would fucking go. They'd be like, oh, you live in a society that's shitty and you have to work and you're cold all the time and everything seems to be wet and moist. I'm dead and it's cool as hell. Do you want to come? I'd be like, absolutely, I do. Yeah, I would definitely have just died. I would have yeah. definitely, just the thought of having moist wool socks constantly, just yeah. like, everyone's just born with trench foot like it's like I would, actually giving me goosebumps because i, I would rather it. not i would literally and the, the streets are just filled with shit that's the thing that i will never understand it's like i understand that science is complex and we still don't understand a lot of things but i understand that if it's if it's coming out of me like whether it's puke piss or shit it's not good and there's a reason yeah. why it's exiting my body yeah and to know that they were just like you know lining the streets with shit like it was christmas lights in the beginning of december it's kind of foul and when yeah. you find out that they would have 20 kids and only one would make it to 10 years old you're like yeah yeah uh, i would that sounds right i don't need the confines of civilization and culture to tell me poop is gross exactly or that you should like wash your hands i touch but something stinky and i'm like i gotta wash my hands i, I will Cora, say and now i'm disgusted yeah. i have to wash my hands but i will say that vampirism maybe is like 
a modern day capitalism in the sense that I would be down to blame it for everything, including my own laziness. <sighs> yeah, that's fair. I so. mean, when you had nothing else going on other than like maybe fist fighting another peasant child for a slice of moldy stale bread, like I guess just enjoying vampire lore would yeah. be like the pastime. A hundred percent. My life isn't easy because I don't have a jawline. And person. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're so right. You know what I mean? So, as rumors and half truths spread throughout the village, the situation surrounding the Tillingas family grew increasingly alarming, and their speculations escalated when more of their children passed away. I feel like I already read that. Um, and each claimed prior to their death that Sarah had visited them during the middle of the night. And the tension peaked when Honor Tillingast, the mother, lay on her presumed deathbed, insisting that her children were calling out to her. Faced with this eerie predicament, Snuffy Tillingast, <laughs> his name was Snuffy. He deserves uh, to die. That's like a really cute Build-A-Bear name. Snuffy. Uh, it's like Snuffleupagus. Yeah. That's adorable. I bet he was cute. The family patriarch, Snuffy, resolved to confront <laughs> the inexplicable circumstances head on. Uh, Accompanied by his farmhand, Caleb. Snuffy ventured to Sarah's grave. Snuffy and Caleb. <laughs> it's like, that'd be like a really cute MTV cartoon. Like, you know, it's push the line just a Caleb. little bit. Caleb is real, and then Snuffy is his imaginary friend. Yeah. So, with determination, they began to unearth her casket. And as the lid was lifted, both men stood frozen in shock and horror. Despite Sarah's demise more than 18 months prior, her appearance bore no signs of decomposition. In a haunting parallel to the account of Mercy Brown nearly a century later, Snuffy proceeded to extract his daughter's heart. According to legend, as he did so, it gushed with blood. So he set it ablaze and reduced it to ashes. Astonishingly, his wife experienced an almost instantaneous recovery from her illness, and what followed were no more sudden deaths nor sightings of their seemingly cursed daughter. Yeah, because all the kids died, so who else is going to die? That's true. But that wraps up the very long tale of how Vlad the Impaler led to a bunch of people in Rhode Island cutting out their dead kids' hearts mm. and trying to eat them. The typical Rhode Island experience, some and would say. Isn't it weird how in the effort to curb vampirism, you become the vampire yourself? By I mean, that's what they say. People and removing their hearts. Interesting. They say it's, you know, not about the journey. It's about the vampires yeah. you become on the way. Yeah, it's um, the maybe the real friendship or the vampires we ate along the way. Yeah, exactly. We're the hearts mm -hmm. of the children yeah. that we ate along the way. Oh, well, I love that. How fun. Who would have thought Rhode Island? The only interesting thing to come out of it is cannibalism. Yeah, I can't name anything else about Rhode Island other than it's the smallest state. Um... I let's see Rhode Island facts. Let's do famous person. Three three interesting facts about Rhode Island. Rhode Island is the smallest state. Yeah, it's not an island. Um, Rhode Island was. It's not an island. I just said it's not an island. No, that's what I'm saying. I'm emphasizing. Yeah. So it's a liar. Yep. Um, Rhode Island was the last of the original thirteen colonies to become a state. So it sucks. I just found out something. What? We're going to have to put some respect on Rhode Island's name. Why? Because DJ Polly D is from Rhode Island. DJ Polly D is from Rhode Island and not even from New Jersey. Wow. The lies no. of Rhode Island never end. Dude, Snooki was adopted from South America. Yeah, I heard that recently too, and that was upsetting to me. She's not even Italian. I think the only real, like, Italian Italians were... Is Vinny. Vinny. And maybe Mike. I don't even think Mike. I really don't. Vinny um, was for sure, because he went... She Snooki has taken two DNA tests to determine her genetic background. In 2014, the first DNA test stated that she had European, Asian, and Jewish ancestry. Five years later, in January 2019, she took another DNA test, which states that she is native Chilean and European descent. Yeah. So this says the only Jersey Shore cast members who are fully Italian-American are Mike, Polly, Dina, and Vinny. Wow. Dina, wow. Yeah. 
Wow. The lies yeah. never end. So Snooki is Chilean, um, but she was adopted by Italian American parent, uh, parents. So, but JWoww is of Irish and Spanish descent. And Ronnie is part Puerto Rican. Sammy is part Greek. And Angelina is part Polish. Wow. That's a lot, honestly, for me to take in right now. That's a lot to handle. Mm-hmm. Also, um, we're going to a Jersey a Jersey Shore themed birthday party, and I think I'm going to be the situation when he broke his neck. Or <laughs> yeah, that's off. good. Um, yeah, that's good. I also heard the idea of someone going as the duck phone. Oh, that's a good one. What are you gonna do? I really want to do beach snooky. Snooky get like arrested? Beach. Yeah. That's I'm a, a freaking good, good person. <laughs> that is a good one. That is a good one. Even though everyone said that I need to be JWoww, which I do find offensive when clearly I just want to be the situation faking his neck injury. Yeah, that's I like that one a lot. There's so much you could do, man. I mean Ugh, I love you that. You could also go as the physical shore store. Like make it on a card. I want to go the license plate that they put on all of the shorts. Oh my god, yeah. Um, well, speaking of Jersey Shore themed parties, you can have a party every time you go to the link tree that is linked in all of our bios. We are at Go to Hell Podcast. I am at Noel Fane. That is at Sith Lord. Um, in that link tree, in all of those bios, you can find a link to our merch. Um, 100% of the proceeds are donated. We are donating to um, the ACLU as they are dividing and conquering the numerous um, anti-LGBTQ plus laws um, that are going into place. Um, and we also have the drag story time um, fundraiser going on. And Chelsea just made a pro orca war shirt which is fun Mm -hmm. um so check that out we also have a link to our patreon dollar gets you in um we had a fun episode this week um playing a little bit of catch up playing a little bit of girly time um playing a little bit of let's talk about what movies we're excited about Mm -hmm. um learn some good things learn some bad things but it was it was fun so check that out you can also get a link to our discord server our facebook group for all the boomers out there and i don't know why you need it but uh places to listen to us we are heard everywhere podcasts are honestly even the most generic ass fucking weird avant-garde podcast host and streamer we're probably on it and you can also find Kelly Holloran or at Wildwood Owls Etsy. Uh, she makes all of our cool ass shit and she also makes cool ass shit in general. So go check her out as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, <sighs> as I am plagued like the human vampires of Rhode Island, which is the worst place in the, in the United States, only maybe only second to Pennsylvania. Um, I would like to give a shout out and honestly a plea because boy, am I suffering. I have no sweets in the house. I have no car. I just want vegan wings, but that's probably not going to happen. So I'm going to give a hail Satan in hopes of maybe any of those things happening. Maybe a chocolate bar arriving mysteriously and magically at my door. Maybe someone getting me DoorDash um, and hopefully a car in my near future. Um, and I will say, hail DJ Polly D for redeeming Rhode Island. Um, no, he's just a liar to me. Um, <laughs> dead to you? He's dead to me. Also, wait, everyone gets to hear this. It's time to be real. Chelsea, look at the camera. Boom. And now Cora gets photographed. This is low key one of my favorite apps. Do you know about this? No, is that the one where it takes a photo of the front and the back. Yeah. Very slay. Okay, let's get the fuck out of here. Okay, bye! Bye!